Today's rather special. I've been given an exclusive invitation to visit a country house deep in the heart of the Cotswolds and to meet the man who has spent the last 30 years creating one of England's most important contemporary gardens. This is an estate of incomparable beauty and purity of purpose. A beacon for all things organic. It's also the passion project of arguably the best royal gardener in history. This is Highgrove House, home to the Prince of Wales, his sanctuary and the outlet for all his gardening aspirations. If you want to look into the heart of the future King of England, then you'd look no further than his own private garden. It's a rare royal invitation. Never before has the Prince given up so much of his time to tell the story of Highgrove. I love it. To me, it's, like a, it's almost like an exhibition. I want to know why these gardens became an organic rallying cry and find out what it's been like to deal with decades of criticism. Bewildered, frankly, but as if you were doing something positively evil. Above all, what does this sanctuary and private home mean to the man who will be king? Like everything I've done here, you know, it's almost like your children, really. Every tree, everything has a meaning and belonging, really. Tonight, the Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall will host the first performance of the Highgrove Suite, a piece of music commissioned by His Royal Highness to celebrate 30 years of royal gardening. In the meantime, I've been given unprecedented access to Prince Charles, the Highgrove team, and these 15 acres of intricately varied grounds with their wildflower meadows, oak temples, with a grand vista that's become synonymous with Highgrove, the Time Wall. Of all the views here, so this, mm. I guess, is the one which is the most iconic. The one which people would say, oh, that's Highgrove, I know that Time Walk. <laughs> what did it look like when you came here? Well, it was extraordinary to think about it. It was just a brown path that came, came across here, went out there, and the grass, and a brown path that went down there, and the brown path that went round there. And, um, you know, there was nothing here at all. The thing that might surprise a lot of people is how comfortable it feels. It's not over-manicured, over no, I hate all that. <laughs> no, I like, I like, as you know, I like working with nature. Yeah. But, you see, I, I actually planned everything in this myself. I did the whole thing. I chose all the plants. And I put everything in the wrong place, basically. You know, all the short things at the back, the tall things at the, the front. Um, the other thing this garden is big on is axes, vistas, right out the front door, yeah. right down to that gladiator yeah. along this path. Well, you see, I just felt when I came here at first, one of the things I did with the Rellas was it's so flat that it needed vistas yes. in all directions, you know, with eye catchers. Which is really from going to other people's gardens, you know, looking in books and things. Mm. Fast, you suddenly get ideas. Well, you, know, you always go, you know, mm. pinch ideas from other people. Yeah. So it's interesting to think that everything we see here mm. is less than 30 years old. Yes. The hornbeams on stilts. Yes. Not the ewes. The ewes were here. Because they were the only things here. But not in these strange... No, shapes. no, they were puddings. Just, just you know, puddings. Of golden ewe. Yeah. And everybody, all the experts said, take them out. Roy Strong said, take them out. Rosemary Berry said, take them out. Everybody. No, it's not like you not to listen to anybody. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> but in the end, I don't know why I thought. Well, I, I thought about it. And then I thought, well, no. But I, do I have a passion for tapering. I hate to mm. tell you. Mm. I, mean, I, have, I mean, I have great fun here because I prune an awful lot. Yeah. When I have my secateurs and my saw. Great therapy. That oh, was terrific. <laughs> well, I mean, because I planted so many trees out everywhere. Yeah. And so wherever I go and walk now, I'm 
was sawing off. Well, that happens, isn't it? The <coughs> thing about gardens is they don't stand still. No. It's not like uh, furnishing a room and it stays and you dust it occasionally. Highgrove is the family home of the Prince, the Duchess of Cornwall, and Princes William and Harry. This Georgian building of neoclassical design was built around 300 years ago. But the house was virtually destroyed by fire at the end of the 19th century and had to be rebuilt, passing into the ownership of Prime Minister Harold Macmillan's son, Morris, before the Prince bought the property in 1980 with a view to creating a future family home in the countryside. You could have chosen any house and land anywhere. So why this one? I'd always see there's another place. I remember it was like that, trying to find a place for a picnic in the car. Do you remember? <laughs> oh, that looks... No, 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 we'll go on a little bit. Do you remember? <laughs> oh, yeah. You know you were. You ended up having a picnic one. where you got to the end. <laughs> place. So, I don't know, I, I came to look at this place, and, um... I don't know, I've, I rather fell in love with the trees, fell in love, in, in the, you know, out here in the fields. I love the, the, the light coming in these windows and so on. But Highgrove, 30 years ago, was a rather modest property, similar to many country houses found in countless English villages. Fine views across to Tetbury left the house exposed to the open countryside. The prince turned to one of the country's most respected garden designers of her generation, the then Marchioness of Salisbury. This doyen of the organic movement and custodian of the historic gardens at Hatfield House was initially underwhelmed by Highgrove. Well, of course, it looked uh, rather bleak and uh, it was, um, although it did have trees, it had nothing, no rail garden surrounding it. It was a very simple classical house, not a particularly interesting one architecturally, but quite um, quite attractive and simple, to which he's added a lot, which has improved it enormously. Where did you start? Which bit first? Uh, the, well, it was really the, the um, Sundar Garden, <laughs> because there was no shelter at all, was, and there was no seclusion, so we were, in those days, being um, permanently um, pursued by the press, who used to turn up down the bottom there with long lenses or down that end or even in here. So there's nowhere to sit. And so it seemed to me the most important thing was to give him this privacy by planting hedges, high hedges, and um, possibly a, a gateway in particular. Today, the hedges may have fenced out the paparazzi, but there's an irony here. Now, more people get to see Highgrove than ever before. Last year, His Royal Highness shared the grounds with 34,000 visitors. Well, when I first started on the garden tours, people were collapsing all over the place and there were no seats. So I felt we must put them in. And this was a present from the Hereford Cathedral Stonemason. Oh, lovely. Well, ladies of the WI of Limpsfield, welcome very much to Highgo. It's very nice to see you here today. I'm sure you've been told to turn off your telephones and no photographs, and I'm going to add, please put your secateurs away now. <laughs> Organised tours raise revenue for the Prince's charities, and the paying public gains access... They see all of the garden. There's not a bit that is kept private. They see it all. They walk very close to the house, and most people are really impressed that they actually get really close to the front door and really close to the, um, the windows in the, in the sundial garden. So they have a very sort of intimate um, relationship with the house and the garden in the time that they're here. It seems very important to you to share it. Well, I think so, terribly. So point for me. I love it. To me, it's like a, it's almost like an exhibition mm. of my paintings. That's the way I look at it. And it's so much more fun if it gives people pleasure. Do you sort of so I keep thinking when I garden, I think about what would it be like for other people mm. as well, you know. Do you eavesdrop on what they say? No. Well, I have done. <laughs> <laughs> Only when they get around outside the window, windows. Sometimes you have to lie on the floor. <laughs> it could be a mishmash, but it seems to work somehow. <laughs> You see, we come from Surrey, where there are all these stately homes with formal gardens, with regimented trees and flower beds. And here, it's all natural. Natural gardens. It's, it's yeah. um, well, real life mm. instead of artificial. Mm. It's very artistic. You can see all his, uh, the prince's artistic features.
Yeah, about the garden is lovely. Yes. So, was the interest in gardening always there, or was there a kind of moment where you suddenly thought, I mm. really like this? I think it was always there, really. Although I never, I never did it much, except as a child. We were allowed a little plot back in Palace, sort of back of the border, growing vegetables and things, my sister and I. But it's not until you have somewhere, obviously, you know, that you of your own, that it's, then, then it becomes more possible, I think. And then I really was interested, because I wanted to, to make it more interesting. And I think the thing about this place was that, as, I, as I've said often, it was a, a blank canvas. Are you good at seeing potential? Do you have well, vision? Can you see I what hope you I do? am, yes, mm. I suppose. Mm. But, as I say, it was a blank canvas, so then I had to start from scratch. And so, the Prince and Lady Salisbury's first creation, a south-facing sundial garden. Wrought iron gates came from a reclamation yard. In the windows of formerly cut yew hedges, busts of His Royal Highness, donated by sculptors and their patrons. Originally designed as a secluded and scented rose garden, these formal beds have evolved into an intricately controlled season-to-season -season floral display. In the spring, hundreds of scarlet and purple tulips, making way over the summer for wisteria, pins and sweet peas. The sundial was a gift from the late Duke of Beaufort, and the garden is Highgrove's jewel in the crowd. All is picture perfect for Prince Charles on a daily basis. But that rain was fantastic on Sunday. I heard yeah. that uh, His Royal Highness was out and uh, got thoroughly soaked and came back thoroughly happy yeah. because there was enough rain. <laughs> oh, it was good, half an inch. Absolutely brilliant. This is a garden of floral pageantry, with vivid colour composition, buzzing bees and a heady mixture of scents. This seems to me to be a garden which sort of satisfies all the senses, really. Mm, it really does. Uh, visual. I mean, there's the aspect of all the different colour. And, and form, of course, form. and axes and distance. Uh, His Royal Highness is very much an artist mm. and uh, has an eye for that sort of detail. Uh, then there's the sound, bird song, uh, and then there's the scent. We've just passed sweet peas. Uh, we're moving Again, on. There's to wonderful Philadelphia. Oh, mock orange in that oh, corner which is it. saturating the and air. Perfectly situated next to the house when the windows are open yeah. and uh, uh, look at that. That oh, yeah. rose. The high yeah. grove rose. Ah! Gosh! And sent there as well in this wonderful confection of purple and crimson. Mm. Glorious. And it's disease resistant which is also uh, a good thing when you're looking at organics is look for resilient plants. Yeah, so that they hold that for you. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that the whole ethos of this garden is a garden that feeds the soul. As we'll discover, Highgrove is a reflection of Prince Charles's spiritual and aesthetic aspirations, where gardening merges with art and music. The Prince of Wales has asked for the gardens to be captured in a suite of music. I think we may have added a beat there. It'll feature his very own harpist, Claire Jones. I did, I did. Just to make and the composer who has the task of taking the gardens and translating them into harmony is Patrick Hawes. I hope, I hope that this will be music which will speak to the Prince of Wales because it's his garden. I mean, there's going to be a lot of people there at the premiere who can enjoy the piece of music as a piece of music. And there's going to be a garden tour just before the concert so they can identify the music with the garden. It's such a wonderful, exciting prospect that you can put something like a piece of music to this original idea that the Prince of Wales has had. Uh, it's such a, th a, a great, fantastic opportunity to really create something that's very personal for him. Okay. This half-hour suite of music reflects Highgrove's grand design to garden in harmony with nature. But the embracing of organic principles has been a long and lonely road. For many years, the Prince of Wales seemed like a voice in the wilderness as he warned of the perils of flying in the face of nature. Interesting then, that those early concerns have since become matters of wide importance. When did the organic principles, as it were, in espousing them... Well, no, well, I, I, again, I, I think I've said endlessly that I, you know, even in the 1960s when I was a teenager, I hated what was going on in destroying and pulling up and tearing down and destroying all the wild places. It seemed to be going too far. And so many of these things, you know, taken hundreds of years. And what you can destroy in one day, you know, it takes forever to, to, to recreate lost habitat. But, so I think I... And I 
groups have felt increasingly that um, you know the the chemical approach and the agri-industrial approach was not something that could ever last it was to me not something that was durable or sustainable in the long run so it seemed to me the health of the soil was suffering and everything else so we had to i felt adopt a system which which understood the need to have a healthy soil and as i said before we have to rediscover the absolute central importance critical our urgent importance of working in harmony with nature. We spent too long ignoring and uh, denigrating her and walking all over her. Look at the result. We get, she comes back and hits us in the teeth, big time. So with the raison d'etre established, it was time to get creative. Highgrove has a look, a style, a managed wildness crowned by eclectic eye-catchers, sculpture, temples and ornate creations. These surprising contemporary takes on classical form are not necessarily what you'd expect. And out of the many leading designers who've contributed to Highgrove, one couple have made their mark more than any others. Julian and Isabel Bannerman view their garden at Hannam Court as a giant laboratory for their award-winning ideas. They use built structures, water, woodland and the wider landscape to create a deeply romantic, scented experience. I mean, we were there at the sort of very beginning at Highgrove and it was sort of great fun. It was the beginning of the sort of organic time, even though you had great thoughts about us. And it was a sort of heroic moment for him to be organic then. Now everybody accepts it, but it was a sort of very lost thing and he kept at it and at it and at it. And, and I mean, even I was sort of slightly, not cynical, that's a bad way, I hate cynical but sort of doubtful of how you could garden this quite complicated garden like time walks without sort of resisting at midnight to putting a bit of spray on the cooch grass creeping through but I mean he really has achieved it and um, all the things that sounded rather boring he ended up by being heroic about it they sort of became exciting didn't they you clearly enjoy working with the Bannermans there's a lot of their work about and the stumpery and the those temples with the the, the driftwood sort of timpani at the top oh, they are wonderful ideas I think I mean just that fountain in the middle of the stumpery you know with the the bits of stone I had and then the gunner on the top that was the I think sheer touch of genius did you ever worry when things like that are going I think is this going to work or oh, not yeah, yeah. but Julian is wonderful because he's always <laughs> oh it would be such fun to do this you know and I said well Julian <laughs> yes 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 another idea you, know, you have to pit him down but he's they're both terrific and, and their own garden is just magical I mean he you know he a job. I mean, he'd be probably running a garden design company too. So he's he's got his ideas he's definitely. Got millions of ideas. Millions, of, millions ideas. of ideas. He's a very good head of a firm. I suppose that's where everybody Highgrove calls him the boss in the garden, instead of my word principe. But he's very good at gathering really good people around him and getting the best out of them and working with them. His Royal Highness and the Bannermans have created what many regard as the signature garden at Highgrove. Stumpery is a striking prehistoric land of upturned tree stumps, gunnera, prickly rhubarb, hellebores, fountains and temples of seclusion. Gigantic sweet chestnut roots carefully jumbled to create convenient luscious pockets for ferns. And all a stage for a national collection of large leaf hostas, a particular passion of the prince, thriving in shady glade. The stumpery is like a world, revealing itself through twist and turn. The concept of garden rooms is quite well established, but the lovely thing about high grow is that you move from one garden room to another quite imperceptibly, and suddenly here you are, having come through the stumpery arch, in front of a temple made out of green oak, and the tympanum up there, full of driftwood-type branches, and in the back, a Prince of Wales feathers, saying, greetings from Sierra. Leone. I suppose this is quite a useful place in which to display gifts from all corners of the world. The Prince has a team of 12 gardeners and they each have responsibility for a specific garden area. Andrew Tolman has looked after the stumpery for the last eight years. The stumpery is kind of an iconic garden really. It's just a reinvention of a Victorian idea. 
but this sort of stunning reuse of what is a redundant material of, of tree stumps to make a fantastic um, wildlife reserve, really. I think this garden is really kind of his stamp on, on the garden world, really. I mean, this is truly unique. I mean, there isn't anything like this in the rest of the garden world. And I think a lot of people that come to Highgrove come to see the stumpery. And I think, to me, it just represents that kind of... This garden is now probably something like 12 years old, and that's given chance for various wildlife to make it its home, really. And this garden is now full of things like hedgehogs, um, toads, newts, slow worms, snakes, all the things which for us are brilliant because they eat all of our slugs instead of eating our hostas. Um, but they provide that kind of natural balance, and which is what we're really after. And it's noticeable in here, I think, of having worked in places where they use pesticides, the big difference in this is the sheer amount of wildlife and the sheer amount of bird song is just absolutely phenomenal. I've never worked in a place with amount of bird song. You're obviously very keen on, well obviously keen on the wildlife, the wildflower I don't want, but also these wonderful bird feeders all the way along the last branch of the old cedar. I thought what you do because I... It's sort of rather fun to have something dangling off. Yeah. And then, then they seem to quite like them in a funny way. But there's more tune to these gardens than just the bird song. Tonight, the Philharmonia Orchestra will perform the Highgrove Suite for the very first time. Patrick Hawes has only a few hours to conduct 40 musicians and the royal harpist into perfect harmony. The orchard room was built specifically to host visitors, organisations, and the Prince's charitable events and concerts. Well done, that's terrific stuff. Yeah. Did you yeah. recognise that as the gladiator? Well, I re <laughs> getting there. It's very ethereal. We're standing outside and it's just drifting through the open doors. It's lovely. Because the great thing in here, the acoustics are not bad, are they? They're not bad at all. Actually, they're good for the size of the string orchestra well, we have. It just kind of keeps it... Stops it becoming too yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. The suite is inspired by precise areas within the gardens, which is the stumpery and the wild flower meadow. You're following a great tradition, the likes of Vaughan Williams, uh, Lark Ascending, you know, countryside, yeah. um, Delius walks to the Paradise Garden. Yeah. We well, look, Beethoven's pastoral symphony. <laughs> countryside moves people. And it seems to me it can only make you write optimistic music. Well, absolutely, because what is there that's unoptimistic about it? It's a constant promise and a constant harvesting of something beautiful. What of the Prince of Wales, in a way, and his whole sort of gardening? ethos do you think comes through or what do you want to come through in your music? Well I can answer that in one word and that's harmony because I know that's an important word for the Prince of Wales not only in terms of gardening but in all the arts and you can see here the way the meadow works in harmony with nature and so that's what an enhance what this wonderful place tries to say. Nothing encapsulates gardening in harmony with nature managed wildness more than the wildflower meadow. A wide variety of species that all take their turn from spring to summer. Natives such as cowslips, buttercups and orchids are augmented with exotic alliums, tulips and camassias, peaking in May with different tones of purple and blue. You'd think that by its nature, a wildflower meadow could be left to do its own thing, but nothing could be further from the truth. Now, people walking through here would say, what a wonderful, natural wildflower meadow. Mm. They, they would, wouldn't they? They would. But it's not like that. <laughs> um, it wasn't like this when His Royal Highness bought the property 30 years ago. So what was it like? Uh, it was a, a meadow, but it was pretty devoid of any sort of uh, wildflowers. So it had chemicals used on it, yeah. so it was really not very species rich. And this is something that His Royal Highness wanted to create, to, something that he reminisced of, of what he saw in the 1950s. 60s and had been lost in yeah. this country and he wanted to recreate it. When you look at it now, it mm. is the most vibrant carpet of so many different species. We've got little self field down there, we've got masses of buttercups, marguerites, moon daisies, orchids yeah, over there coming up like it. little purple candelabra. The secret then of getting a meadow like this is what? It's absolutely the opposite of what we need to do in the garden. There you want to enrich the soil, here you want to actually 
impoverish, impoverish it. it. And that's why the yellow rattle, which you can see there, is the key element uh, in, a, in any sort of uh, um, meadow that's too rich. You because this is a, a wildflower which feeds off the roots of grass, so it weakens the grass that it grows in one. It's a semi-parasite, that's mm. really, it's in, the, it's in the same family as our snapdragon. Yeah. Which is, and it's such a pretty little one. And called yellow rattle because when the seeds are, are ripe, mm. they, they rattle in their little... Mm. And it's just an annual as well, that's the other thing that uh, you have to remember, so that it's important that uh, you don't cut it too soon before the yellow rattle actually sets seeds and drop. So this is the key, isn't it, really, then, apart from making sure your soil is poor and, and introducing a good wildflower seed mix, mm -hmm. is the right time to cut it. So when do you cut this? You can actually manage a wildflower for the species you want to encourage. So this one we cut mid-July to early August. I do think this is wonderful. Just a, a rough mown path, though, going through wildflowers. It's as bonny as any garden. <laughs> One of the great joys about the meadow is, is, is going around now each year counting the, the, the orchids, the wild orchids. Mm, mm. And that is a huge excitement because it was completely dead, this, this field, when I first came. Do you find now, sometimes, you come out here and you think, actually, I like this bit best because it's going to worry about yeah. a meadow in flowers, isn't it? But you have to have real patience again because it's just the constant management. Mm. I and mean, years and years later, after I'm dead, hopefully it'll get better and better. If we talk about likes and dislikes in gardening, you obviously love topiary. Yep. What are the hates? Because every gardener has them. I can't stand gladioli, and I get it in the neck for them. No, I'm not. I'm not mad about, you know, very hot colours. And as you can see, I rather love clipped things and, and the combination of different greens and well, yellows. What, what you also get is this wonderful shadow when the sun comes out no, like no, this. No. Suddenly, it all moves, and it's not like an enormous sundial. Yeah, it? yeah. It swirls around. No, no. Are you, are you um, a patient gardener, are you? I'm not now. I'm getting more and more impatient. As you get older, do you not Well, you know you've not got the well, time. Well, that's the point. And whereas, you know, when I first started to put the, the yew hedge in, and it was, you know, they were just this size. I, I suppose it was, it was, I thought, when are they ever going to grow? But maybe shovel manure on, which helps a lot. But now, if I'm planting hedges, I, I don't think it drives me mad. Why aren't they growing? <laughs> no, I think, I think good, good old-fashioned, well-rotted manure is the secret of everything, I think. Conventional gardening focuses on the plants, whereas organic gardening is all about nurturing the soil. Debs was keen to introduce me to the unsung hero of Highgrove. So this is the powerhouse of the garden then, Debs, the compost heap. It's actually <laughs> the most important aspect in an organic garden, because what you need to do is feed the soil. What uh, goes in must come up. Confuses a lot of people about composting. Nobody knows really quite what to put in. So, what goes into your heap? Well, as you see, the grass clippings. We've got the shavings from the uh, stables yep. with the manure, which is great. Uh, we have uh, anything from sort of the herbaceous material. Bulb uh, seed as you cut off. That's right. The only thing we don't put in is any of the pernicious weeds. Yeah. You know, Vine weed, uh, ground elder. Ground elder goes to the chickens. It comes back in a different form. <laughs> they love that. This now here is superb. So how old is this? It's wonderfully brown and crumbly already. Well, you've picked out the good bit, Alan. That's actually, you can see there's grass here as well. About six weeks since that, since that stage. Uh, and it's warm. It's the, I mean, the heat generated by a compost heap is astonishing. And that's the bacteria actually rotting it down. That's what makes the really good compost. Mm. This is six weeks then. What's this lovely brown crumbly Isn't Christmas that great? And end? that's still, uh, oh. we're talking about, you know, 12 weeks? 12 not weeks, far, not far. You see, from that to mm -hmm. that in 12 weeks is astonishing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've always found the secret at home is mixing everything together, mm -hmm. keeping it relatively firm so it doesn't dry out and relatively damp, but nevertheless not soggy. That's right, and that's why turning it gets air into it. And air yeah. is a really important aspect of it, so that all the uh, um, bacteria and everything can actually work properly. Yeah. So this now is, is ready when you want it to go back? No, 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 no. I mean, we've got it composted down, but it still needs to sort of age like a good wine. It needs no, weight. So be grateful for no, it at this point. no, no, no. It does need to mature because it's actually just too hot still to right. put on the garden. Yep. So you let it mature. And uh, literally, you can see we've got the next one, which is uh, sitting there. And that, that's how much. I don't believe this. Four you know, stages of compost. Uh, yeah. Not just two. So start to finish, how long? Twelve weeks to get to where it's. It's really well sort of processed, but then, to be honest, I'd rather leave it for four yeah, months yeah. to six months before we actually put it on the garden. So it's the panacea for all ills, but how much of it do you produce in a year? A heck of a lot and not enough. It's the trouble in the garden, the two things that are never big enough. One, your greenhouse, two, your compost heap. Mm. <laughs> it's this level of behind-the-scenes industry at Highgrove that allows the creation of such elaborate gardens.
Here you go, there's a richness of detail, whether it's the path you're walking on here with these stones on end, or the wonderfully weathered stumps with ferns billowing from them, carvings on the back of gazebos and summer houses like this one. You get to the point where you think, well, maybe it's just for show, but then you're reminded that this is a family garden. There's a tree house up there. Look inside it, you'll see a child's tea set. Well, two children's tea set. I don't think there's any more, but Princes William and Harry had a great time in there when they were younger. When you go around the garden, it still does feel like a family garden. It's lived in, from the tree house to little arbours to sit in. So clearly it's a garden which is very used by the family. Well, yes, I mean, I, well, I'm glad you think so, anyway, because mm. I'm, uh, I'm always intrigued what people think it's going to be like before they come. They all think it's going to be frightfully sort of manicured and formal and... I don't know why they think that, but anyway. And, uh, and so when they come, they're amazed, I think. Gosh, there's a weed, look, there's nettles or something. <laughs> well, why is that grown over the paths? Do you think it gives them confidence themselves? Well, thinking, oh, mine's as good as that. So. <laughs> but it's rather like, well, I don't know. It's rather like painting, when I see it, rather like painting a, a watercolour, my gardening. You know, you want to lay on the colour, don't be, don't be sort of careful about it in some ways. I used to be frightfully careful, you know, when I started. But now, the great thing is to slap it on, if you can. And, um, and so I rather see it like painting a picture. Do your sons, do the princes, share your passion for gardening? No, not yet, I don't think. But it, you never know, one day perhaps, when they have somewhere of their own, then... That seems to be the key. It seems so to be ownership and custodianship. Yeah, which. so, I mean, they're not... No, they're not people who rush off and, like, potting up things or whatever else or planting at the moment, but you never know. But I didn't do that very much either when I was young. Over the last three decades, an acre of fruit and veg is grown in the walled garden for the house and its guests, yet every detail has been aesthetically thought through. Just because a garden is utilitarian, it doesn't mean it can't be beautiful. All the fruit trees here are trained. These are in all great spheres atop single stalks, and then you come to a tunnel of apples that you can walk under. The beds in front where the herbs grow are decorative. A hedge here of rosemary, angelica and lovage interwoven with golden marjoram. It's a William Morris of a garden. Have nothing in it that you do not believe to be beautiful or know to be useful. Now people always say it's all right having organic garden in the flower garden but the place where you're really tested as an organic gardener is in the kitchen garden because it's here that you know pests are most troublesome if you like pests mm -hmm. and diseases mm -hmm. what are the secrets then do you think Deb, of, of having a good organic kitchen garden well you feed the soil so that you have the plants are as healthy as, as they can be so that they can resist disease that's one element and you can see the muck that we've got in here well rotted farmyard mm -hmm. um, and the great thing about of course when you get all that muck in there is it helps hold on to moisture because they need that's to grow evenly without being checked. That's right. How do you make sure though that you get wildlife into a walled garden like this? Well it's encouraging the habitat for them so we've got fruit trees which uh, the birds can actually feel at home in there. They're not... There's a uh, wonderful arch of apple trees. Mm. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. well. And it, it, uh, it provides protection for the birds but don't forget the insect life as well because uh, there are beneficial insects that we want to encourage. And so this is a little hedge which is just super. It's uh, germander and late June into July it comes up into flower. The flowers encourage the hoverflies, the butterflies. And, they, and the bees and whatnot come and pollinate your crops mm -hmm. as well. So it's a whole, again, the, the cycle's cycle. evident, isn't it? It really? really works. What do you do, looking at these spuds here, with things like potato blight, which, you know, when a certain amount of atmospheric humidity occurs, your potatoes are going to get blight. How do you deal with that when you're going? It's making sure you keep an eye on everything, and, and as soon as you see blight, you cut down the foliage. You don't want it to go down and through the tubers, and so literally getting the foliage down uh, as soon as you see any form of blight. So is it you call active management. Active management. The organic produce from the estate is now an internationally recognised brand, established against the odds of mainstream thinking. It's easy to forget now, because organic growing is so popular, just how unusual and offbeat it was 25, 30 years ago. Mm. Well, you had to put up with all the, uh, the unbelievable stuff. That you were going backwards and it was irrelevant and it wouldn't work and all this stuff. Royal 
Miles before his time, and when he first started doing the organic and the landscape, I mean, I think everybody thought he was poshy, and I used to feel very sorry for him and annoyed. But um, that you'd get this sort of criticism, what is he up to, and nobody would take it seriously. And, well, blow me, I'd like to say something a bit stronger than that, um, he's proven him totally um, wrong, and it's quite a, you know, hard thing to have done in those early days, because as a sort of member of the royal family, you have to be a bit careful, not tread on too many people's toes. You got a lot of flack. Did you ever feel like giving up? I had a lot of for a lot of things. <laughs> uh, but it's certainly funny how it goes round. But, uh, no, of course not. Oh, well, yes, maybe. No, I didn't know, because I knew what I was doing. Dispiriting now and again, but it is still determined. Oh, yes. Yeah. But, I mean, bewildered, frankly, by it. As if you were doing something positively evil. You know, potty this and potty that and loony this and loony that. What's well, harm in it? It's, it's nothing mad or eccentric about it. I mean, if you've grown that little bulb, or even probably planted a lily seed and see grow uh, you know you have that relationship with your plants and but it's mocked as though it's something half potty to do <laughs> I'm afraid I, I love the country and I like and I like being in touch with things that, you know, well, of course you know, I happily talk to the plants of course you know, the trees and all these other things <laughs> <laughs> listen to them <laughs> I think but, all gardeners uh, no. do but, I mean I, I think it's absolutely crucial and I, as far as I'm concerned, I know I've forgotten putting in the um, uh, reed bed sewage treatment system. Oh, that would be kind of thing. But no, all sorts of people came to have a look, and they still do. And I was so funny because you've got a wonderful, a wonderful piece of paper from the German gentleman who helped put it up. So you are now the proud owner of the sewage garden. <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> and uh, so I am the proud owner of the sewage garden. But uh, no, I, I just knew that that was the direction. It's been like that with. I've done. Prince Charles has always insisted that all high groves water and waste be recycled. The runoff from the roofs and all the royal bath water goes back into the grounds. Even the drains flow directly into a garden designed as a sewage processing plant. So does all the waste product, as it were, from the house and the estate come into this place here? That's right. From the orchard room, from the main house, from all of the staff facilities. So what are we looking at here now? We've got an enormous sort of stone-sided tank, in effect, mm -hmm. filled with Phragmites, Norfolk reed. And they act as a natural filter, uh, filtering that sort of raw liquid sewage. Mm. And then what we see trickling out of here is the first stage of purification. So you can see it coming across this bit of pavement mm -hmm. here and into this enormous boggy area here, which has got these, mm. these coppiced willows. That's, that's the next filter system. And willows have braces here, yeah. where it's going through the uh, Norfolk reed, then through the willow. Carries on. You never know. One day, perhaps, when they have somewhere of their own, then that seems to be the key. It seems so to be happens. ownership and custodianship. Yeah. So I mean, they're not. No, they're not people who rush off and like potting up things or whatever else or planting at the moment. But you never know. But I didn't do that very much either when I was young. Over the last three decades, the family has enjoyed the bounty of a garden, which isn't just about pretty flowers. An acre. A fruit and veg is grown in the walled garden for the house and its guests, yet every detail has been aesthetically thought through. Just because a garden is utilitarian, it doesn't mean it can't be beautiful. All the fruit trees here are trained. These are enormous great spheres atop single stalks, and then you come to a tunnel of apples that you can walk under. The beds in front where the herd grow a decorative, a hedge here of rosemary, angelica and lovage interwoven with golden marjoram. It's a William Morris of a garden. Have nothing in it that you do not believe to be beautiful or know to be useful. Now people always say it's alright having an organic garden in a flower garden but the place where you're really tested as an organic gardener is in the kitchen garden because it's here that you know pests are most troublesome, if you like, pests mm -hmm. and diseases. Mm -hmm. What are the secrets then, do you think, Deb, of, of having a good organic kitchen garden? Well, you feed the soil so that you have, the plants are as healthy as, as they can be, so that they can resist disease. That's one element. And you can see the muck that we've got in here, well-rotted farmyard mm -hmm. manure. Mm -hmm. um, and the great thing about, of course, when you get all that muck in there, is it helps hold on to moisture because they need to grow evenly without being checked. That's right. How do you make sure, though, that you get wildlife into a walled garden like this? Well, it's encouraging 
habitat for them. So we've got fruit trees, which uh, the birds can actually feel at home in there. They're not... It's a uh, wonderful arch of apple trees. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. right. And it, it, uh, it provides protection for the birds. But don't forget the insect life as well, because uh, there are beneficial insects that we want to encourage. And so this is a little hedge, which is just super. It's uh, germander. And late June into July, it comes up into flower. The flowers encourage the hoverflies, the butterflies. And they, the bees want not come and pollinate your crops mm -hmm. as well. So it's a whole, again, the cycle's heavy. Isn't it, it really works. What do you do, looking at these spuds here, with things like potato blight, which, you know, when a certain amount of atmospheric humidity occurs, your potatoes are going to get blight. How do you deal with that when you're organic? It's making sure you keep an eye on everything, and, and as soon as you see blight, you cut down the foliage. You don't want it to go down and through the tubers, and so literally getting the foliage down uh, as soon as you see any... ...from the estate is now an internationally recognised brand, established against the odds of mainstream thinking. It's easy to forget now, because organic growing is so popular, just how unusual and offbeat it was 25, 30 years ago. Mm. Well, you had to put up with all the, uh, the unbelievable stuff, that you were going backwards and it was irrelevant and it wouldn't work and all this stuff. Royal support for the organic cause provided acres of copy for the press. He was miles before his time. And when we first started doing the organic in the landscape, I mean, I think everybody thought he was poshy and I used to feel very sorry for him and annoyed. But um, they get the sort of criticism, what is he up to? And nobody would take it seriously. And, well, below me, I'd like to say something a bit stronger than that, um, he's proven totally um, wrong. And it's quite a, you know, hard thing to have done in those early days because as a sort of member of the royal family, you have to be a bit careful not to tread on too many people's toes. You got a lot of flack. Did you ever feel like giving up? I've had a lot of flack for a lot of things. <laughs> uh, but it's only funny how it goes round. But, uh, no, of course not. Oh, well, yes, maybe. No, I didn't know, because I knew what I was doing. Dispirited now and again, but it's still determined. Oh, yes. Yeah. But, I mean, bewildered, frankly, by it. As if you were doing something positively evil. You know, potty this and potty that and loony this and loony that. What's the harm in it? It's nothing mad or eccentric about it. I mean, if you've grown that little bulb, or even probably planted a lily seed and seen it grow, uh, you know, you have that relationship with your plants, and but it's mocked as though it's something half potty to do. <laughs> I'm afraid I, I love the country, and I like I, think I like being in touch with things. That, you know, well, of course, you know, I happily talk to the plants, of course, you know, the trees and all these other things. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to them. <laughs> I think but, all gardeners uh, yeah. do. But, I mean, I, I think it's absolutely crucial. I mean, I, as far as I'm concerned, I've never forgotten putting in the um, uh, reed bed sewage treatment system. Oh, no, no, because, but no, lots of people came to have a look, and they still do. And I was so funny because we got a wonderful, a wonderful piece of paper from the German gentleman who helped put it up. He said, you are now the proud owner of the sewage garden. <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> and uh, so I am the proud owner of the sewage garden. But, uh, no. I, I just knew that that was the direction. I mean, it's been like that with everything I've done. Prince Charles has always insisted that all high groves water and waste be recycled. The runoff from the roofs and all the royal bath water goes back into the grounds. Even the drains flow directly into a garden designed as a sewage processing plant. So does all the waste from all of the staff facilities as well. So what are we looking at here now? We've got an enormous sort of stone-sided tank, in effect, mm -hmm. filled with Phragmites, Norfolk reed. And they act as a natural filter, uh, filtering that sort of raw liquid sewage. Mm. And then what we see trickling out of here is the first stage of purification. So you can see it coming across this bit of pavement here mm -hmm. and into this enormous boggy area here which has got these mm -hmm. these coppiced willows. That's, that's the next filter system and willows have that uh, capacity to do the same thing as to purify water. So we literally have belt and braces here yeah. where it's going through the uh, Norfolk reed then through the willow and carries on. What for you are the best moments in the garden? When do you feel most at one with it, aren't you? Um. Well, what I love is, is I do sort of I do some evening patrols at the weekend and um, potter about and that's when I notice things and weed and prune or, you know, saw off bits. So the physicality is important as well? Oh, vital. Mm. Vital. I mean, I, I, I love all that. Getting involved and doing it is, is, is what I enjoy. Because I'm sure most people come here and think I just you know, give orders and don't do anything. I do. And then
other thing I really love is laying hedges in the winter, you see. So that also is, 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 is something that keeps you relatively sane, I think, and is very good exercise. Prince Charles's love of trees is well documented, and within a secluded glade in the Arboretum lies the sacred heart of Highgrove. Only the Prince may enter this small building, commissioned to mark the millennium. It's made entirely of natural materials, common earthen walls, bath stone footings and pillars with a Cotswold stone roof. For many of us, our garden is an escape a sanctuary from the worries and the bustle of everyday life. So too is the Prince of Wales's garden, but within this larger sanctuary is a smaller one called the Sanctuary. Just think about it. The Prince of Wales is never, ever alone. He has security men, he has staff. He's seldom on his own, except in there. It has four doorknobs. Only one of them works. I don't know which one, and I'll never find out. The main thing about this garden is the fact that it's a quiet area, it's a reflective area, it's a way of place of contemplation. It's kind of a wondrous garden, really. It's almost a garden of kind of um, mystique. Um, there's an element of sort of hidden world about it. It's actually working an out little piece of stumpery there, and I pulled out a piece of paper, and um, someone had written a tiny note and stuffed it in the stumpery for someone to find. And it said, to whoever finds this piece of paper, this garden is beautiful. I've still got the piece of paper on my notice board at home. And it's that kind of thing that this garden really meant something to that person walking around on their deck. And they left a note for someone to find. So to me that's what really makes it special. This place is obviously a great solace when you come back home. I get the feeling when you come in the garden as a kind of letting off of steam. How important is it? Terribly. It's, it's, it's wonderfully therapeutic. Mm. And particularly that thing came back each, you know, after a week usually, and, and seeing the difference. And this week, it's extraordinary the difference in one week. Mm. How everything puts on so much grace. This time, because well, the rain is... Well, I go around telling everyone it's a blessing. <laughs> yeah. Papa garden. You turn the tap on, it doesn't appear by magic. <laughs> it's the stuff of life. Much of organic gardening involves a leap of faith, a trust in nature. Do you get dispirited when it goes wrong? Oh, yes. But I... I if you become philosophical because you realise that it... It, it, it varies every year, so what goes wrong one year doesn't go wrong the next year. It, it, I mean, nature is very good like that. If you have a bad year for potatoes, it isn't always a bad year the next year, you, you know. Although the fortunes of planting will ebb and flow, some parts of the garden will always be more permanent than others. At Stowe, the famous 18th century landscape garden in Buckinghamshire, there's a huge ornamental structure known as the Temple of Worthies, which houses busts of eminent Britons such as Elizabeth I and William Shakespeare. Well, the Prince has his own take on this with the Wall of Worthies, supporting busts of some of his greatest friends. Deborah, Dowager Duchess of Devonshire, Richard Charters, Bishop of London, Patrick Holden, Head of the Soil Association, and underneath him, Tigger. That's where the Prince of Wales's favourite Jack Russell is buried. Well, you can't get a better friend than that, can you? And so this royal tour of a private family garden with a public face is almost at an end. But the premiere of the Highgrove Suite is about to begin. Those invited to this most exclusive of occasions have donated large sums, all for a good cause, of course. Most events at Highgrove are to raise money for charity, and tonight's performance will help disadvantaged children, Prince's Foundation for Children and the Arts. Confident, relaxed, and just want to deliver. Absolutely. I mean, we have one of the finest orchestras in the world at our disposal, so um, what can go wrong, you know? <laughs> Debs and her staff have exchanged their gardening gear for more formal wear. Windows into the lives of the Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall are rare. And my journey around Highgrove has been a unique treat. 
Whatever your opinion of the gardens, there's no doubt that they reflect the passion and commitment of the man who created them. Royal Highnesses, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Orchard Room, the Prince of Wales' estate uh, in Highgrove. Um, though it seems rather odd to welcome the Prince and wear the Duchess to their own house, but, uh, but I do, along with you. Do you think you'll always keep high growth? You want to see it through to the end? Well, I, well, I, it'd be quite nice if I could um, shuffle off this mortal coal, but it's still here. <laughs> yes, I'd be awfully sad because you know it's like I mean, everything I've done here. You know, it's almost like your children. Really. Every tree, everything has a meaning and um, sort of belonging. Really, terrible thing. Really, you mustn't get too attached. I, I try not to. But but it is clearly a family house. I shall have to detach myself, really. <laughs> psychologically. Not yet a while. No. What a special evening, and proof, if proof were needed, that a garden like this can offer solace and inspiration to all kinds of people. To those who walk around it and share a glass of champagne in it, to those who are in lines seem to love being here. That music might have stopped, theirs will continue, hopefully for a long time. Oh, it's terrific. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, because I planted so many trees out everywhere. Yeah. And so wherever I go and walk, I was sawing off. Well, that happens, isn't it? The <clears throat> thing about gardens is they don't stand still. No. It's not like uh, furnishing a room and it stays and you dust it occasionally. Highgrove is the family home of the Prince, the Duchess of Cornwall, and Princes William and Harry. This Georgian building of neoclassical design was built around 300 years ago. But the house was virtually destroyed by fire at the end of the 19th century and had to be rebuilt, passing into the ownership of Prime Minister Harold Macmillan's son, Morris, before the Prince bought the property in 1980 with a view to creating a future family home in the countryside. You could have chosen any house and land anywhere. So why this one? I'd always see there's another place. I remember it was like that, trying to find a place for a picture.